Yeah, it's good to see you guys. You guys can have a seat. Um, Miles is all the way on the other side of the world on the Journeys of Paul cruise. Um, Mark is up visiting his son up in uh, uh, San Luis Obispo area. And so while the cat's away, <laughs> the mice will play. So we are going to do something a little bit different today because I lack any kind of adult supervision here. Um, we are going to try to do something that I have not successfully done, and I may be even including first service in this. Um, we are going to cover about 10 chapters this morning. Now, the last time I did this, it was about 12 weeks, so we will have to trim a bit. Um, now, the reason that I'm undergoing this, not because I, well, maybe because I'm insane, but the other side of it is, um, when I was young, I went to Mount Rushmore. Anybody, anybody been to Mount Rushmore? It's pretty amazing. You look at this and it's huge and it's really cool. But if, you're, if you go through the different exhibits that they show about how it was made, there's a picture. And there's a picture of this guy and he's just like working the jackhammer. And then they pan back a little bit. And there's a little bit bigger. And you pan back all the way and he's in a nostril. Like he is just in there inside the, this tiny spot. And sometimes when we look at the scriptures, when we go verse by verse or chapter by chapter, Sometimes we lose the grandeur of the picture as a whole. So today we're going to look at the picture of the whole over the life of Joseph. So we are not going to cover every detail because you don't have the time and I don't have the desire. We are going to look at, we're going to look at some salient points as we go through this. Um, I'm Jason, if you guys didn't know. I'm a, a family ministries pastor. Usually I'm next door talking to the high schoolers. Um, so if I seem immature, that's rubbing off on me. So, all right. Genesis 37, we're going to start in verse 1, but before we actually get started, let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we dig into your word today, as we, uh, as we seek to cover a lot of ground, Lord, I pray that you would be with us, Lord, that you would uh, help me order my thoughts, help me to deliver the words without tripping over my tongue, and Lord, more importantly, we pray that what you have for us, Jesus, today would come shining through, Lord, that, Lord, that the, uh, the truths and the message, Lord, that we see in the life of Joseph, Lord, that it would be something that resonates with our soul and draws us closer to you, Jesus. So, Holy Spirit, we give you free reign here, Lord. We give you free reign to dig around in our spiritual junk drawer, Father God, to, uh, to maybe bring some things to light that, that we haven't thought about or that we're intending not to think about, Father God. Maybe it's things that that you want us to get rid of. Maybe it's something, Lord, that you want us to do more of or do better. Father, whatever it is, we give you free reign today to, to poke around in our life, Father God. So be gracious with us, Jesus, and help us to, uh, to grow to be more like you. We pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. All right, so we start out in Genesis chapter 37, and it says, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings, the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. We're going to park right there for a minute. Joseph here is 17 years old. And 17-year-olds, I will tell you this, they have a superpower. It's true. We've been, uh, we live in a fantastic time where there's all kinds of fascinating brain research coming out about how the brain develops and things like that. Now, at about 14, usually like a, a year or two after puberty hits, the brain starts to change on how it thinks about things. And it's pretty cool. It's fascinating. It, it gives kids a superpower. Because the prefrontal cortex, where we do all of our, our like higher decision-making and risk management, is not completely developed yet. Now, we run the risk of looking at that like, oh, well, that's a problem, and you know, we, we, gotta, we just got to make sure they get through it till they're, they're done baking or whatever. But see, here's the thing. It's not, it's not a bug. It's a feature for programmers in the room. It's this is not a mistake. This is something that God has designed. So they have the ability to look at things and go, oh, I could totally do that. When the rest of us go, 
oh, that's way too dangerous, or that's way too scary, or that's way too, I, no, I could never. They don't have that. They look at it and they see possibilities. We look at it and we're like, oh man, we see medical bills and things like that. And they look at it like, no, I could totally do this. Which is why young men fight wars. Because nobody's convincing a bunch of us, you know, 40 and 50 somethings, like, hey, go run up on that beach. Like, first of all, no, I don't run. <laughs> Second of all, they're shooting. Like, we just, we got ships, just bomb them. But see, that's that superpower that God has given people that age. So Joseph is in the thick of it. He right there has that. He is like, I can do this. And we see the first thing about Joseph, he brought a bad report of, the, of his brothers to his father. Now, we can, because of our past, because of our past family relationships, um, if you're an oldest child, uh, like me, you're probably thinking, it's a tattletale. There we go. There's the younger one. Guess what he did? But Joseph is 17. His oldest brother at this point is probably somewhere around like 35, 37 years old. Joseph brings a bad report of his brothers. Now, on the face of it, Joseph here is being honest to his dad. Because we've got to remember, this isn't just a family. This is a family business. So when Joseph comes back, he brings a bad report of his brothers to his father, and Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors, but when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all the other brothers, they hated him, and they could not speak peacefully to him. We see like the worst possible thing happening here. We see a father going, that kid's my favorite. Now, whether we think that or not, we don't say it. And we surely don't give them like, hey, this is the best kid t-shirt. Like, the, what a recipe for disaster. But that is what he does. He makes him a coat which signifies that I am greater than my brothers. The perfect way to start out all kinds of family disharmony. And I'm not saying that before this, everything was hunky-dory. This family has issues. But we see that this becomes a focal point. That, oh, here's Joseph. And he's wearing his special coat. Oh. It's interesting watching this happen in my own kids' lives where they start to, well, we never got to do that at his age when they look at the younger ones. We had to, I had to wait until I was like 15 to watch Lord of the Rings and he's like nine and ah, and it's all this stuff. And it's like, oh, I get it. You were the test, you know? We, <laughs> sorry, but... Joseph here, part of what's happening is Joseph is being groomed for executive level leadership. His father sees qualities in him that have make him go, yeah, you know, because part of this thing with the coat is a signifier that this is not the guy that does manual labor. This is the guy with the clipboard and the grease pen who goes, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This is, he's not, he's not going to be the one with the dirty hands. So his brothers see this and they're like, oh man. And they hate him. So Joseph has a dream. Now, we are not going to get into the particulars of Joseph's dreams. I'm going to leave so much of this stuff uncovered. Hopefully, you guys will get all excited and go back and study up on it. It's fascinating stuff. But Joseph has a dream. And in the dream, the brothers find out that Joseph's dream is about them bowing down to him, which it's like, I mean, even better, right? Oh, so now, now we're going to, now, oh, you're telling me your dream. Oh, we're going to bow down before you. Oh, okay, great. Who wants to hear that from a 17-year-old kid anyway? And then he has another dream. And in this dream, his parents bow down also. And his dad's like, so it was funny when it was your brothers, but now it's me? You think I'm going to bow down to you? This is not going to happen. But it says his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in his mind. His father stored that in the back of his head. Now, verse 12, we are going to jump forward quickly here. His brothers went to pasture the father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. Go and see if it is well with your brothers and the flock and bring me word. So Joseph here is being sent out by his father to check on the family business. We sometimes have a tendency to look at this and go, oh, there goes a snotty kid again. But no, he's trusted by his father to bring back truth. 
to bring back an accurate report so the father can administrate what's happening. So he sends Joseph out to Shechem to find the brothers. And what do we find out happens? The brothers are not at Shechem. Joseph is wandering around the fields at Shechem going, there should be a flock. There should be brothers. There's like 10 of them. Like there should, I should be able to find them. He can't find them anywhere. But he comes across a guy and he says, uh, what are you looking for? And the, guy, and the guy asks him, what are you looking for? And Joseph's like, well, I was looking for my brothers and the flock. They're supposed to be here. And he said, oh, I heard him say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. So what's going on here? The Bible doesn't specifically tell us the difference between Shechem, where they're supposed to be, and Dothan, where they are. Now, some of the commentators, they kind of like hint at the fact that Dothan might be the place where um, young men go for wine, women, and song kind of thing versus Shechem where your flocks are supposed to be. So either way, they are not where they're supposed to be. And this is important because what do we know about Joseph? Joseph is going to be honest. Joseph is going to tell his father what's going on. So another thing that we're going to notice as we go through the life of Joseph Every significant change in Joseph's life is marked by a change in his outfit. So we start out, significant portion of his being a son is marked by his coat of many colors. And I thought about wearing one, but then I thought that's just really tasteful and uh, horribly and just like not good. So yeah, I saved all of us from that because I don't want to be that. So, but what we know about Joseph in this period of his life that I'm calling the sonship He's favored by his father. He's trusted. He's honest. He's sent to check out the family business. Uh, hated by his brothers. He's given authority over them. And he uses his gifts and abilities. Now, does Joseph maybe lack a little bit of tact? Probably. But he's 17. 17-year-olds 17 are not overly gifted with tact. If you have one, you know that. Teenagers will sometimes say things and you're like, why would you say that? They're usually at the most appropriate moment as well. So Joseph as a son marked by his coat of many colors. Now we get into Genesis chapter 37, verse 18. Joseph goes and finds his brothers at Dothan and they saw him from afar before he came near to them. They conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come, now let us kill him and throw him into one of these pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. Now, when your presence inspires your brothers to say, let's kill him, that's a problem. It indicates that there is an issue here that we need to look at. Now, it's interesting because you look forward in Joseph's life, the same things that make his brothers want to kill him are the same things that make him excel in other places. So we have to be very careful in our family relationships to realize that sometimes what we see one way may not really be what we think. Sometimes when we see that kid that just constantly is like pushing against authority, maybe it's because God is raising up to, be, to have them in a position of authority. Maybe this is an opportunity for a, who knows? But we know that we, one thing we do know is if we have families, we're going to have issues inside families. It's just a part of life. It's a part of having sinners in a small group to grow. So we have to, we have to be conscious of the fact that maybe what's going on in our family isn't the problem we think it is. Maybe we just need to change how we look at it. So they see him from far off. They're like, hey, let's kill this guy. And Reuben says to them, hey, you know what? Let's not kill him because I don't want to be guilty of his blood, let's just throw him in a pit. We'll just chuck him in a pit and we'll leave him there. Because Reuben is thinking, I'll go back later, I'll pull him out of the pit, I'll send him home and say, dude, don't do this again, because they're going to kill you. So Reuben here is arguably trying to do the right thing by saying, let's just chuck him into a pit. When that's the best option, I think it's indicative that there is a problem. Um, so they throw him in the pit, and it says in verse 24, they took him, threw him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. Here's the thing. The pit's not empty. Because Joseph's in the pit, and God is with him. 
This is something that we see throughout the life of Joseph over and over and over. So Joseph is in the pit. The brothers are hanging out because now they've got a problem. We've thrown him in a pit. If he goes home, we're really going to get in trouble now. So in order to cover it over, they're like, oh, we'll just kill him. But then there comes this caravan of Ishmaelites, this Arab caravan that's heading down to Egypt, and they go, ha-ha. There's no profit to us to kill him, and then we'll be guilty of killing him. Let's just sell him. So that's what they do. They sell him off into slavery for 20 pieces of silver. And they caravan heads off to Egypt. Reuben returns, because he was gone for a little bit, shows back up, he looks in the pit, and he's like, oh, no. What am I going to do? How am I going to go back to dad? He's going to look at me and say, what happened? And I'm going to say, um, funny thing. This is going to sound bad when we say it, but it made sense in our heads. Um, He says, the boy is gone. Where shall I go? And they took Joseph's robe, they slaughtered a goat, and they dipped the robe in his blood. So they take the coat, the symbol of his father's affection, the symbol of his executive level leadership, the symbol of all the hopes and dreams that his father had for him. They tear it up, they dip it in blood from a goat that is owned by their father. So not only are they killing his son and destroying his property, they're actually taking the father's property to be a part of it. So there's all kinds of levels here to what's going on. And they bring it home and they walk up and they're like, hey, dad, you, you seen a coat like this before? Does this look like Joseph's maybe? It looks kind of like, my, do you think it's Joseph's? And they ask him to identify it. And Verse 33 says, he identified it and he said, it is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without a doubt torn to pieces. This is where the chapter closes for Joseph in Israel. Everybody is certain that he's dead. Well, the father is certain that he's dead. The brothers are like, well, he's gone. We don't have to worry about it anymore. And now they spend their time trying to comfort Jacob who does not want to be comforted, I'm sorry, and he says, no, I shall go down to hell to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer to Pharaoh, a captain of the guard. So Joseph here in the brother stage, we can see hated by his brothers. Why? Because Joseph does the right thing. And if you're doing, if you're surrounded by people that are doing the wrong thing and you're doing the right thing, either they're going to love it or they're going to hate it. In this case, his brothers hated it. And he was honest enough, we know that Joseph was honest enough that they were not going to be able to get away with not being where they were supposed to, not doing what they were supposed to be doing. We get no input in this section from Joseph. We don't see anything from Joseph's perspective. We see it from the brothers' perspective, which I think is interesting. Um, But we have to step back and realize that a lot of this is because of the position his father put him in. Because of putting him in at favored status. Because there's a lot of things. We could say a lot of things. A lot of things might have been done wrong. But the thing that we do know, that we rest in through this entire thing, is that God has a plan. God knows exactly what's going on. He's not shocked. He's not dismayed. He's not like, wow, I didn't see that coming. He knew this was going to all play out the way it plays out. And a lot of it he sets up exactly. So keep that in mind. So now we go into Joseph's slave portion of his life. <clears throat> Joseph is brought down to Egypt. Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, very high-ranking official in Egypt, buys Joseph. And it says in verse 2 of chapter 39, the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in house and field so that he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Joseph here, showing the same qualities 
and the same traits is a huge benefit. They see, Potiphar sees him and says, wow, God is really working through this guy. Who, Potiphar, who doesn't know God? The Egyptians did not worship the same God. They had multiple gods that represented all kinds of things, which is funny if you go through the Exodus and you see the 10 plagues of Egypt, they're all directly focused on a different Egyptian deity. Um, anyway, we're not going to get there. We don't have time for that. So he sees, he recognizes that there is divine input in this kid's life. And he takes him a slave and turns his entire house over to him. Like, I don't have to worry about anything. And I didn't, I'm sure it didn't happen like that. It's not like he came home and said, oh, you look good. Take care of everything. But Joseph showed who he was. He showed how he loves God and how he follows what God calls him to do. And he becomes the ruler, basically, over Potiphar's house. So the only thing in Potiphar's house that he didn't give him was his wife. It's like, dude, take care of it. I can totally, I can... I can sit back and relax and trust that you are going to do the right thing and I am going to profit from it. Now, what does that mean for us? Where are you at? What outfit are you wearing? Are you wearing the outfit of employee, employer, parent, whatever? See, Joseph could have just gone, well, I'm a slave. I'm just going to keep my head down and try not to get myself in trouble and you know, this guy is an Egyptian. I don't like him. So I'm going to do the bare minimum. Joseph didn't do that. And it was evident to the Potiphar and his household that God is with this guy. See, sometimes we're in situations where we don't necessarily want to be, that we didn't really choose to be there. Somehow it feels like we just ended up in these spots. God wants to use us in those. God wants us to shine in those situations. God wants to use us to reach the people around us. And this is all happening here in Potiphar's house. So Potiphar, who doesn't know the Lord, recognizes that the Lord is with him. Everything's going great. And then Potiphar's wife comes into the picture. And she, being an eminently subtle and ladylike lady, says in verse 7, after a time, his master's wife cast her eye on Joseph and said, lie with me. Like subtlety, just like, you know, like, it's, it's, I don't know what message she's sending. No, it's very clear. So, but Joseph's response is really interesting because he says, behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in this house. He doesn't think about anything in here. He doesn't worry about anything. And he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? See, Joseph recognizes that the situation he's in, it would be wrong. For him to lie with Potiphar's wife would be wrong. It would be wrong for him, for her, for his master. But he understands, ultimately, the problem is, is I would be sinning against God. Which is the perspective that we need to have. Because otherwise, it's very easy to justify dumb stuff. Well, I'm called to submit, and I get that, but... I can't stand this guy. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to spend 20 minutes sharpening pencils. Why? Because I just can't wait for this day to be over. That's not Joseph. That's not God's heart for Joseph. That's not God's heart for us. So he, she says, lie with me. He says, no. And then the day comes when she and he are in the house alone. Nobody else is in the house. She grabs a hold of his garment. Oh, hey, clothing, Joseph's life. This should be like highlighter for us. Grabs a hold of his garment, and she's like, no, now you're gonna. And he's like, no, I'm not. And he wriggles out of his garment, and he runs out of the house. And she is left there holding his garment. And for the second time, Joseph's garment becomes an instrument of deceit. And she holds it, and she says, look what this, look what this Hebrew has done. My husband brought him into this house and look at, he's tried to attack me. And she holds on to this and she waves it like a flag and she is just, and she, Potiphar comes home. She gets him all upset in verse, sorry, I flipped my page too fast. Verse 18 there, it says, but as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of this house. So as soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, 
His anger was kindled, and Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. So he's, he gets mad, and he says, no, 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 off to prison. But the thing we need to remember, look at the prison that he sent him to. He didn't send him to, like, normal, like, junky prison. He sent him to Pharaoh's prison, where the king's prisoners are confined. He sent him to the nice prison, which tells us a couple things. Even despite this, even if Potiphar believes this about Joseph that he did that, he still says he's not a normal run-of-the-mill guy. We're going to send him to the nice prison. Or it tells us that maybe Potiphar's like, I know Joseph, and I know my wife. (laughs) And I can't really keep him, but I'm not going to... I'm not going to lop his head off or send him off into the field because it's, you know. So either way, he ends up in the nice prison with the king's servants. Um, Joseph, through this, understands if he sins against his master or his employer, he was actually sinning against God. Joseph has the perspective that all authority over him is placed there by God. And so even those who are in authority are not great people. Even if you're stuck having to be under authority to somebody that I don't respect, God put them there. So we need to make sure that we understand the way this works. If the authority is over us, God has placed them there. And we need to remember that. And we need to act in a way that shows them who God is. So out of his coat of many colors, into slave garments, in his master's house. Now he's lost that. Now he enters what I call the prisoner phase. In chapter 39, verse 20, Joseph's master put him into prison, the place where the king's prisoners are confined, and he was there in prison. Verse 21, once again, this becomes an anthem over Joseph's life. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. So Joseph gets the rug pulled out from under him again, and he ends up in prison. And in prison, just like in the pit, what does he find? God's with me. And so he steps out in the abilities and the gifts that God gave him, and he starts to do what he does. And the keeper of the prison recognizes that, like, hey, this guy's really good. This guy's really useful. This guy's really trustworthy. And he starts to deliver all of the tasks that he has to Joseph. And he can sit back and go, this job just got a lot easier. This is our function as Christians. We are called to be salt and light. In the situations that we're in, we should be making life better for those around us. Now, whether or not they recognize that, that's up to God. Because Joseph, through the same honesty and the same qualities, was hated by his brothers, but now has been loved by everybody else that's come across him. Let God worry about how other people react. Our job is to do what he's called us to do, to be his hands and feet. So once again, there he is. And sometime after this, a couple of uh, Pharaoh's very chief people end up in prison. His personal baker and his personal cupbearer. Cupbearer was responsible to bring whatever Pharaoh was going to drink to him. The baker was there to bring him food. And one thing we know is that we are very excited about food and drink. If you go without it for a couple days, you'll realize how excited about it you are. If you ever have a chance to do a fast, I recommend it because... It's enlightening about the strength of our flesh. So these two guys end up there, and the captain of the guard, where if we flip back, we can see the captain of the guard who was listed earlier, his name was Potiphar. Ooh, interesting. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them, and they continued for some time in custody. Two very high-profile prisoners, and they're like, hey, Joseph, You take care of these guys. And so Joseph does. 
He would have anyway, probably, but now he does in particular for them. And he, to the point where he notices one day that when they're, they get up and they're hanging out, he notices that there's, there's something going on. They've got downcast faces, it says in the scriptures. And he says, why are you so downcast? What happened? What's going on? And they're like, well, we had these dreams, which is funny because dreams again. And he said, why are your faces so downcast? And we had dreams. And he says, Joseph says, do not in- interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. He says, interpretations belong to God. Tell me. Joseph understands he is there as a representative of God. He's in that situation to represent God. And they come to him and they're like, we had these dreams. He's like, oh, tell me, tell me, tell me. So they tell him the dreams and he explains it to them, which teaches us a couple things about Joseph. Yes, he interprets dreams through the gift of God. Second thing, Joseph is willing to deliver difficult messages because one of the guys gets this awesome interpretation. Yeah, you know what your dream means? You're going to go back to Pharaoh and you're going to serve him and life is going to be good. And the other guy's like, well, here's my dream. And he's like, well, guess what? He's going to hang you and you're going to be dead. Oh, Joseph doesn't shy away from delivering a difficult message when that's what God gave him. Now, I don't like that. I don't like delivering difficult messages to people. If there's a big group, that's okay. But if it's one-on-one, it's even worse. It's like, well, here, like, if you ever talk to a parent sometime, like, your kid, your perfect angel that has never done anything wrong, here's the deal. Those are difficult conversations. Joseph does not shy away from that. He's willing to, to step into that. And in this period of Joseph's life, we see the very first time where Joseph says, I think I'm going to try to get out of this. He says, I, 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 I shouldn't be here. And these are his words exactly. When he's talking to the cupbearer who's going to be released, he says, only remember me when it is well with you. And please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh. And so get me out of this house, for indeed I was stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here I have also done nothing that they should put me into the pit. He goes, I haven't done anything wrong. I didn't do anything wrong at Potiphar's house. I didn't do anything wrong at home. Remember me, mention me to Pharaoh when I get out of here. It's the first time we see Joseph actively try to get out of the situation that he's in. How does that work? (laughs) Ha, 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 ha. Verse 23 says, yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. This was Joseph's shot at getting out. This was Joseph's shot at taking a hand in his own destiny. This was Joseph's big chance to get out of here. And the guy forgot. What does that tell us? People are going to fail us. We are going to trust people and they are going to let us down. There could be something so important to us that it is like this is the number one thing on our mind. Like, you got to tell Pharaoh when I get out of here. You got to tell him when you get out to, to get me out of this place. I don't deserve to be here. But he forgot. You did not forget Joseph, though. God did not forget Joseph. God is with him. And God indeed keeps him there. Ooh, that's an uncomfortable truth, isn't it? Sometimes God, sometimes God keeps us in situations that we would rather not be in because he has a better plan. Well, God, I don't want to be in this circumstance. Okay. But you don't have the, you don't have the perspective. But I don't want to be here, God. You don't understand me. And he's like, but you need to be here. Sometimes he doesn't even say that. Sometimes it's just like this, this silence where it's like, God, get me out of here. And all you hear is echoes. But God did not forget Joseph God has something better in store. Um, If you are into brewing or the brewing arts or winemaking or any of that stuff, there's one thing that almost nobody tries, and that is orange wine, using like oranges, because it is a long process. It is a long process. And for most of that process, it's bad. Like, it's bad, bad. Like, the way that it's described most of the time when you crack it open to check it to see how it's aging, it smells like vomit. Not an appetizing smell. But the thing is, 
supposedly when you get to the end and it's where it needs to be, all of a sudden it's great. Sometimes we take a long time to brew. Sometimes we take a very long time to get to the point where God says, you are now palatable for these other people. So Joseph here is there. And then we move on to the different part of his life. Joseph's life we're calling the sage portion. So after two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed. Joseph spent two more years after thinking he finally got his ticket out. Two more years in prison. And Pharaoh has dreams. And we're not going to go into the dreams. You can go back and dig into the dreams yourself. They're awesome. They're fantastic. We don't have time to dig into it right now. So anyway, well, we see the same pattern. He has a dream and his spirit was troubled and he sent and he called for all the magicians in Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. This is chapter 41, verse nine, or verse eight. All the wise men in Egypt had nothing for Pharaoh, which is kind of a bummer because Egypt's a pretty big nation at that point. They've got nothing, but see, this is the moment that God's been waiting for. This is where God sets things into motion again in Joseph's life. And while Pharaoh is there, troubled by his dream, the cupbearer is like, oh, snap. <laughs> hey, um, remember like two years ago when we had that thing and you threw me in prison? There was a guy in prison and... We had these dreams, and he interpreted the dreams, and when he, what he told us they meant is exactly what happened, and I don't know, everybody else has kind of failed. Maybe, maybe we talk to him. Verse 14 in chapter 41, <clears throat> then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. Another outfit change, and there he is before Pharaoh. Quickly, it says. The situation seemed totally hopeless for Joseph. Like, I wanted to get out, and the guy forgot. It's been two years, and all of a sudden it's like, hey, dude, come on, you're going before Pharaoh. Shave, get dressed. We got places to go. Okay, immediate change there. So Pharaoh says to Joseph, I had a dream. There's no one who can interpret it. It was heard that you have, when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And Joseph says to Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable interpretation or a favorable, let me get this right exactly. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Joseph is so confident in God that he makes this statement to Pharaoh, well, I can't do it, but God will give you a good answer. That takes guts. I was in prison 10 minutes ago, and now I'm standing before Pharaoh, and it's like, God will give you a good answer. Like, um, okay. And so Pharaoh tells Joseph the dream. And in verse 25, Joseph says to Pharaoh, oh, well, the dreams of Pharaoh were one, because Pharaoh had two dreams. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. Oh, Pharaoh, God's telling you what he's going to do. He's laid it all out for you. I can't believe you didn't get this. But anyway, here it is. He lays out, this is what he's about to do. Tells him all what it all means. And then he says, for the fact that the, the doubling of Pharaoh's dreams means that the thing is fixed by God and God will shortly bring it about. And Joseph could have stopped right there. This is what your dream means. That's it. This is what, you want to know what it means? That's what it means. But Joseph doesn't stop there. Joseph, because of the gifts that God gave him, is looking at this going, okay, there's a problem and I think I know a solution. So he goes on Past that, verse 32, he finishes interpreting. Verse 33, he takes over and he starts laying out a solution. Therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land. Take one fifth and yet it goes through this whole plan. And the last part of that, he says, so that the land may not perish through famine. It says, God's telling you, there's going to be some great years. There's going to be some famine years. What you need to do is you need to find yourself a trustworthy guy, have him go out and enact all these different plans because this will enable you to survive. 
Now, if I'm in Joseph's shoes, am I overly concerned about the life of the Egyptians? I would hope so. I suspect maybe not. But Joseph, he sees this and he says, oh, God's given us an opportunity that we're going to go ahead and take care of this. God's given us an opportunity to, in effect, save the world. Which is exactly what Pharaoh sees. Because check this out. In verse 37, chapter 41, this proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? How's that for a ringing endorsement from your heathen boss? This guy's got the spirit of God. Why, thank you. (laughs) Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over all my house and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand, put it on Joseph's hand, and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. In this instance, the change is like that. There's not a big waiting period. It's like you're out of the pit. You know what you're doing. You go. You take over Egypt. Here's my ring. Here's new clothes again. Now you go take care of Egypt. Save the world, Joseph. Wow. (laughs) What a change. So Joseph goes out from there. Joseph, at this point, it says in verse 46, that Joseph was 30 years old. 13 years he spent in Egypt, and now he is 30 years old. Joseph has two kids. This is really, I found this Totally fascinating. He has two sons. I'm not that that part. That part's pretty run of the mill when most people have kids. But Joseph calls the name of the firstborn Manasseh, which means forgetful. And he says, because God has made me forget the strife, the trouble, the problems, the hardships that I had in my father's home. So he names one forgetful. And the second son he names fruitful, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. See, Joseph here is, in effect, shutting the door on his past and saying, past is past. I am fruitful now in the land that God has placed me. Because Joseph sees this as the end. This was God's plan all along. I get to save Egypt. But see, Joseph still doesn't have the same perspective as God. Because we know that God's perspective is way greater than that. Because what happens through this? Joseph stores up food to the point where they said they can't even count it. They stop measuring and counting because there's like, there's no way, it's just incomprehensible for us to even think of this much food. So they start storing up grain. The famine hits, and what happens? Everybody's hungry. He saves Egypt. The surrounding nations come to Egypt for food. He saves them. Through this process, Joseph ensures that Egypt becomes the strongest centralized government in human history till that point, I think. Because what happens? He buys everything for the food. He sell, he takes, in exchange for food, he takes property, he takes livestock, he takes 20% in perpetuity forever. Pharaoh now owns everything. But see, God's plan was bigger than that. Because one day Joseph's brothers show up and he tests them and finds out, hey, my brothers have changed. Life is different. My father's still alive. I have a, I have a younger brother. And so he brings the resolution to the family. But that wasn't the end of God's plan. God's plan goes further than that. And you go forward and you see that God brings Joseph's family down. 75 people, brings them down. They settle in the land of Goshen. Joseph arranges it so that the Egyptians and the Hebrews are separate from each other which enables something to happen 400 or so odd years later that a new Pharaoh arises who did not know Joseph and starts to hate the Hebrews. And through this process, we get the Exodus. And God's people who go into Egypt as a family of 75 people come out as a nation of 2 million. And they go back to the land that God promised them. But that wasn't the end of it. Because you move forward from that and you get to a manger in Bethlehem, years and years later, where a Savior's born. And that opens up the door for us. 
So there's this whole big plan that Joseph did not see. But see, Joseph was faithful through all of it. This is what God calls us to do. He doesn't call us to understand everything because we couldn't. But he calls us to obey, and then he makes us a part of what he's doing. The worship team's going to come forward. We're going to go through another song as we're worshiping together. Search your heart. God, where, where are you calling me to be faithful that I'm having trouble right now? God, where are you calling me to do better than I'm doing right now? God, where are you calling me to be comforted because right now it feels like I'm in a pit? I don't know what suit of clothes you guys are wearing. I don't know if you're wearing, like, I feel like a prisoner or I feel like I'm in charge of the world. I don't know. But God knows. And God has a plan for what you're doing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we... uh, as we see Joseph, Lord, here, <laughs> saving the known world, Lord, you've called us in some ways to do the same thing, Father God. Maybe it's not as far-reaching. Maybe it is, Lord. We don't know. We don't have the perspective, but Lord, help us to be faithful.